act now to cushion the impact of rising food prices and skyrocketing energy prices? That's the message from the opposition PNP to the governing JLP in Jamaica. Joining me today to discuss prescriptive approaches to solving these crises, plus solutions on how the government can improve labor relations with trade unions and bargaining units is the opposition leader, Mark Golding. Opposition leader, welcome. Thank you, George. To Pleasure again. to be here with you. Excellent. Uh, if the PNP was in office, Secretary mm -hmm. uh, Spar was everything else had constant, the economy, mm -hmm. what it is, the global economy, what it is, strife, what it is. Where the overall approach to the relief that you mm. speak of is concerned, what would you be doing? Mm. I think that we have to recognize that the, globe, the global environment and Jamaica as a small island state operating in what is essentially a, a hostile global environment currently uh, has changed somewhat. With the two years of pandemic, uh, which has led, and it's not yet over, and it's still having an impact on supply chains, availability of supply, prices of commodities. Then the issues in the Ukraine with Russia's invasion, and you, both Russia under sanctions now, Ukraine uh, destabilized by war, and they, they are both major suppliers of um, grains, mm -hmm. corn, wheat, which makes flour. Mm -hmm agricultural chemicals, fertilizer. This is having a massive impact. And we have seen inflation uh, from 2021 starting to rise globally, Jamaica as well. Bank of Jamaica has reacted to that by um, increasing their interest rates on, on a number of occasions. But because a lot of this um, price inflation is imported, mm -hmm. uh, the immediate impact of the BOJ's attempts uh, is not as direct mm -hmm. as it might be if it was inflation generated as a result of monetary conditions here. Yes. So we are in a situation where wages are pretty stagnant in the country, but the cost of living, and especially food prices and oil prices, has been re spiraling. And we feel that it's essential that the government react to that and preserve the social fabric of the country. Um, and tide, uh, get us through this period until things start to normalize. So from the point of view of the financing of our program, we had called for uh, expenditure, additional expenditures on social support for vulnerable people of 2% of GDP for this mm -hmm. fiscal year, which we said could be financed by slowing the pace of debt reduction. Mm -hmm. So we're all committed, the country's committed to, and it's even legislated mm -hmm. that we should get our debt to GDP ratio down to 60% of mm -hmm. GDP by 2028. That process really started with the PNP administration yes. of Porter yes, Simpson. Did. We found ourselves in a situation when we came to office at the beginning of 2012 with a debt to GDP ratio at 147% or thereabouts, which was um, totally unsustainable. And we worked hard to change the dynamics around that. We passed numerous laws to modernize the tax system, improve collections, improve the commercial architecture of the country. In a very, and I don't want to get into the details of that, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I could. Um, and by the time we demitted office, the debt had reduced from 147 to 115% of yes. GDP. This government under the JLP has continued that process, and it um, had reached 94% of GDP by the beginning of the pandemic. Obviously, with a massive hit to the economy, mm. the GDP element of the debt-to-GDP ratio shrank. Yes. So the debt-to-GDP ratio went up temporarily um, to, uh, I think, nearly 110%. But with the recovery of the economy from that re reduced base, we have seen it come back down to 97. And they're projecting to take it into, I think, mid-80s or high-80s at the end of this fiscal year. And we're simply saying, look, given that the country is under tremendous strain and stress, and it's a daily hit where people are seeing prices going up and up and up, mm. the government must step in because there are people who are on the edge. And we've seen it manifesting in almost daily demonstrations of one sort or another across yes. the country, whether it be over roads, whether it be over 
how police are, there are transport authorities dealing with taxi men, whether it be in the public sector, yes. how that's playing out in terms of reacting to the attempt to rationalize and, um, and reclassify uh, the compensation arrangements within the public sector. Yes. Um, we are, last week we had several major strikes, yes. the Water Commission, the air traffic controllers, the NHT, even the civil servants had issued a strike notice. So all of these things are interrelated, and we yeah. think that this is a, the government must do more. So, so here's the thing. So, so the, the first question I posed about what would be the, mm -hmm. the approach you take, that's the theme of the conversation we're having. We're talking solutions. So, sure. so, so I, I note your, your mm -hmm. original response, your opening mm -hmm. response. But here's the thing then. The issue of the, the, the fiscal rules mm -hmm. and the commitment to stay the course of debt reduction I was in front, I was sat feet away, uh, meters away rather, from the former finance minister, Dr. Peter Phillips, at a press conference when he said that what the then PNP administration and cabinet had to do to take us on the path out of debt, he wished that no subsequent administration would have to do so again. I mean, throwing ourselves at the feet at the mercy of the IMF and looking for a partnership there and trying to find a way out of the woods. Mm -hmm. That's one thing for you to consider. The other thing is, as the finance minister noted in his closing budget presentation, much of what attends to the fiscal rules in terms of how it should work and the commitment enshrined was developed by you as a legislator. So he's saying, because, because so I, I went back there when I saw your press release mm -hmm. because I wanted to see what he said at the time. And he mm -hmm. said, look, the commitment is, and the reason the law is as robust as it is, and the reason so much work went, the reason so much work went into it is because we are committed that whatever happens, we need to stay the course because it, has the, it is at the end of that cycle that this country can really crack on mm -hmm. on the way forward. You know, are mm -hmm. advocating for a departure. And mm -hmm. people who know what I just articulated are saying, well, Mr. Opposition Leader, you have to give us some more of the why. Yeah, well, it's, it's not um, in any way complicated what I'm saying. First of all, the government itself has departed from the fiscal rules. It, um, in the first year of the pandemic, they suspended the fiscal rule for the, for the whole of that fiscal year because they were going to be in breach of the ratios. So, and that was in response to a shock. Mm. Um, and they had our support in doing that. And with the current... Uh, but it's a kind of shot that would have been prescribed by the multilateral partners and... and no, and they, this is a matter that is now addressed in our own law. Well, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so to depart from it mm -hmm. for the reasons that you've said, mm -hmm. to free up an extra $40 billion, mm -hmm. would, would, would not be the same as the kind of shot that... 2% of yeah. GDP is a relatively modest mm. um, adjustment to the pace of debt recovery and would not in any way... Um, change the trend of debt recovery, which is already coming down. I'm just saying slightly slow the pace of it so that there are some resources to take care of an immediate problem, which is very deep and very severe. In the, debt, in the wage to GDP ratio, they have abandoned the fiscal rule because they realize that the 9% of GDP, mm. which is prescribed in law mm. and which is now in breach, is not achievable if you want to have a public sector that can service the needs of the nation. Yes. So the reality is that while one is committed to objectives which make sense and which are essential for the long-term sustainability of our economy, one has to be pragmatic in addressing immediate needs. And they have seen that in certain contexts, but in this particular yeah. context, I think they're missing, Here's, uh, the, you, you, missing the ball. And I, would, um, and I would simply say that the effects of the pandemic, the aftermath of the pandemic, and the war in Ukraine mm. are sufficiently severe that they warrant an adjustment to the pace of debt recovery for this fiscal year yeah. and the identification of additional resources to increase NIS pensions, yes. the levels of relief on the path, yes. the poor relief for persons who are not on path, and the social pension for those elderly persons who are not getting NIS or any other relief, and any other um, clearly vulnerable groups that need some support. It's nothing to do with uh, uh, any, any uh, abandonment yeah. of, of a commitment to where we're going. Well, to the, the contrary, yeah. if we do not address these issues now, yeah. we may find that we have longer term negative impacts which yeah. make it harder to achieve those goals. Well, well here's the thing though. Mm -hmm. All right, so you speak of path. Uh, last fiscal year, they did what? 
8.3 billion, I'm not talking earmarks, talking about what was actually spent, 8.3 billion, then they had another 1.4 on top of it, so 9.7, and they're going above that this fiscal year according to what the finance minister says. But here's the thing, this is a question I, I asked when I was watching your presentation in the budget debate. When you said the 40 billion, the 2% of GDP, I said to myself, well, clear, well, it's Mark Golding, so the numbers aren't eerie theory. But why not 1%, why not 1.5, why 40 billion? Precisely why was 40 billion more needed at that time? And precisely why 40 billion more is needed now? Not a greater figure, not a smaller figure. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you to clarify that. Yeah, look, it's a question of how you assess the degree of the severity of the problem and the kind of response that is needed to address it. I, having lived here through the pandemic and, and saw the attempts that, um, under the care program to address the issues that the population were, was facing then, I saw that there were major gaps, I saw that there were inadequacies in some uh, critical areas and people felt it and, and are still feeling it and it's getting worse and I just based on my own assessment of the impact of the care program and the direct payments under the care program because Nigel included in, a, in his overall assessment of what the government was doing, he included a lot of things which are really not, in my view, um, what I'd call targeted social expenditures, which is what I'm talking about. Yes. So he, he included things that helped the public bodies that had, had their cash flow impacted and things like that. And, and help to deal with the, the pandemic expenditures related to health. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about helping people to survive a crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's my assessment of what would be a meaningful contribution. Is it sufficient? Maybe not. But I'm saying I, don't, I, I, I think that the country does have certain constraints over how much it can allocate this. But I think this would be a manageable amount and would be significantly be, um, more than is being spent now and is needed to, to try and keep, tide the country through this particular period, mm. you, know, you may disagree. Um, your assessment may be different, but I think that from what I see on mm. the ground and how I see people hurting, mm -hmm. more, is needed, more needs to be done, and we're playing with fire by ignoring that. But, but here's the thing, though, and mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, it doesn't matter who forms the administration. Mm -hmm. Government, the provision of government services, there are those in, inefficiencies in that that are, that are almost in, inherent, systemic, whatever you want to call it. When governments are to provide benefits, there's also a, a, a provision deficit, I'm calling it. I, I say that to say, um, opposition leader, that the amounts allocated under the CARE program, it's mind-boggling how much money is still on the table because the government has been unable to find, at the other end, Master, Master Tom or Ms. Sheila, who needs that, that allocation that is given to the various categories of people. And I'm saying, mm -hmm. if we have a system that is inefficient in getting money into the hands of the people who need it, then for me, it doesn't matter how much mm -hmm. is in the kitty to disperse, because you're still going to have critical mass not getting something to help them through. Yeah, well, that's another issue. And that's to do with the efficiency of the distribution of the benefits. But that's a real problem, though. Well, it's a real problem because the methodology that was used at the time was put a, a, a high level of importance on ensuring that nobody got a benefit who shouldn't, mm. right? So, for example, for the small business owners, if they were unable, and this is really in the, in the more informal elements of yes. the economy, if they were unable to provide certain bureaucratic um, confirmations of their business, mm. they, they, would, they were ineligible. So you left out many, many small business operators who just couldn't mount that hurdle. Mm. Um, similarly with the um, distribution of the compassionate grant, for example, the attempts to use the banking system to do that, mm. where many people who are relatively unbanked, they may have bank accounts that are dormant and so on, yeah. that became very problematic. And, um, and so persons were being frustrated because the payments just weren't coming through. Yeah. I think those are issues, administrative issues, that could be conquered yeah. or overcome by greater flexibility. Here you on that. Let's take the break right here. Mm -hmm. Speaking with the opposition leader in Jamaica, Mark Golding, he says now is the time for action, that the government is not doing enough. Mm -hmm. And insofar as the rules that we are bound by to uh, practice governance, that those rules, this is a time of crisis, uh, those rules, some of those rules, can be tweaked to help the people. That's his message. More from him after this break.
back with us on the conversation. My guest is the leader of the opposition in Jamaica. His name is Mark Golding and he's sitting with me today to talk about prescriptive approaches to the crisis facing Jamaicans, the crisis of high food prices, the crisis of soaring uh, energy prices, and of course the crisis facing persons who work in the public sector, the industrial relations, climate fraught with discord and unrest. And the government has a job on its hands, bringing those representing the workers and the workers themselves to the table. and. Uh, charting the way forward that all can be satisfied with. That's going to be a job and a half, one suspects. All right, uh, opposition leader, let's talk now about the ad valorem tax because you were kind enough to draft a ministerial order, uh, march to the Ministry of Finance's Heroes Circle office and uh, deliver it to the finance minister in tow with your supporters, of course. And you said that the beauty of the particular solution of the uh, capping of the ad valorem tax is that the budget was cast on the assumption, I'm quoting your press release, of world oil prices at 67 and 50 US dollars per cent, 67 and 50 cents US per barrel, mm -hmm. and capping the taxes derived from oil at that price would not adversely affect the fiscal accounts. First thing I want to ask, mm -hmm. your, your, your ad valorem solution how is it different from what you articulated when you spoke in the budget debate in March? It's the same. Right. Same uh, so the reason I ask if there's a difference is because mm. the finance minister addressed it then to basically, well, he, he poured more than cold water on it. He was very dismissive of the idea because he said, look, well, we all know that if the ad valorem price goes up, ad valorem, which is uh, according to value from the Latin translation, then, of course, the, the earnings go up. But ad valorem is much smaller part, I'm quoting him, part of the overall fuel tax makeup, accounting for just between 22 and 26 percent of overall fuel tax intake. So even if the prices rise sharply and the government gets more ad valorem, if volume falls, the amount derived from the special consumption tax, which is approximately 74 to 78 percent of the revenue intake, can fall more than the ad valorem rises. He says that this is not something that is sensible. This cannot be done. You have a different view. Yeah, I have a different view. Um, clearly, if volumes fall, tax collections will fall. Uh, but, you know, we haven't seen a basis for saying that that should be a factor as to whether or not we cap the ad valorem um, SCT on fuel. The budget was cast uh, on an assumption as to fuel prices mm. at $67.50 US per barrel. Oil prices are now over $100 US per barrel. And I'm saying, and we have been saying, if you, in determining the ad valorem SCT charged on the ex-refinery price um, of fuel in Jamaica, uh, on the assumption that the price is $67.50 US per barrel, then you can pass through the benefit of that to consumers not just consumers who are motorists, taxi operators, mm -hmm. commuters, but even persons using electricity because electricity and the fuel cost and the tax on fuel is part of the electricity cost. So we have run the numbers, we have got the data, and our estimate is it's approximately a $4.2 billion saving in the ex-refinery price mm. per annum that would be derived from that. That is meaningful. The compassionate grant on the the government in the care program for the fiscal year 2020 to 21 was four billion dollars. Mm. The SOP to consumers that was offered by the finance minister in terms of a subsidy on electricity prices mm. was 3.7 billion dollars. So this is a bit more than that. And of that 4.2 billion, 200 million of it is on the kerosene side, and four billion is on it on the fuel, the petroleum side, mm. meaning the gas and diesel. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, this is something which wouldn't, as I had said, adversely impact the budget because it's not part of the fiscal numbers if you've projected those numbers based on 6750. Mm. But it would ha have a, a meaningful impact on, on, on motorists, on consumers, etc. And furthermore, that impact would actually be greater than the 4.2 because that's the ex-refinery price. But when you, keep, when you adjust the ex-refinery price by reducing the ad valorem in that way, when the dealers add their markup and the retailers add their markup, then the consumer at the pump gets an even better and bigger benefit. So the actual benefit to consumers would be more than four billion, maybe closer to six billion. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but but even at six billion, and I heard you. Mm -hmm. well, well, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna let's let's talk let's let's discuss it at six billion and not four point two because mm -hmm. you you of course you speak truth when you mm -hmm. say it's greater than four point two. Mm -hmm. 
at six billion dollars, mm -hmm. if say we give, we have a population of what three million? Two point seven, I think. Two point seven. Let's mm -hmm. go two point seven. All right. And if you give the poorest Jamaicans, if we imitate what they've done with the the, the care program, you give poor the poorest Jamaicans twenty thousand dollars per month out of out of the pool. Say it's six billion dollars. Uh, per month to take them through. Um, and I'm calculating it oppositionally based on those who say this is this is like very inadequate mm -hmm. to deal with the crises at hand. And so it is cosmetic, that's the word I'm looking for. It, 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 it's cosmetics at this time because mm -hmm. the savings aren't substantial enough to be able to apportion amounts to persons who are struggling the worst in these times and for them to see meaningful impact. Mm -hmm. Because they'll say that what the, the program the government is pursuing, and this is their line, the program that they are pursuing mm -hmm. is likely to net meaningful results at the end. This solution of yours mm -hmm. is, I mean, if we go at six billion tops, mm -hmm. it's not substantial and they already have the care program in train. Well, the care program has kind of ended. But the, <clears throat> this is an incremental benefit. I've already indicated that I think from the point of view of social expenditures, mm. the ex government expenditure should have, should have been increased by $40 billion, 2% of GDP. And that would be um, additional cost to the budget and would be financed out of slowing the pace of debt reduction. Still having debt reduction this fiscal year, assuming that the, the recovery continues, um, but slowing the pace of it. This is really a specific measure that would not impact the fiscal accounts because those revenues that I'm talking about uh, above the $67.50 uh, per barrel are not in the budgeted uh, revenue estimates, but would impact everybody who has to consume oil or products in, um, derived from the use of oil. So it would have an impact on those people. In, but I'm, I agree with you that that in and of itself right. is not the solution, but it's past, part of an, a, a broader um, approach which I have been advocating for, which is one of trying to cushion the crisis, trying to get people to survive this period um, rather than watch this, the, the society uh, start to fragment. And, mm. you know, we're looking at, we are very um, vulnerable to shocks. You yes. know, for example, the tourism industry, which is trying to bounce back yes. after two years of pandemic. I mean, if things, you know, if bad news coming out of Jamaica is, is bad for the tourism industry. So that's just one example of why it makes sense to try and preserve the social fabric, preserve social cohesion, and the government must be seen to be doing something. And it has some symbolic value as well, because we all know that when the, the weekly publication of the adjustments to the gas price oh, yes. is, a, is a thing that is a, 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 we call a, it bad news Thursday a, a recurring yes. it's a recurring decimal and yes. I think the government should be showing motorists and the commuting public and so on that they are doing something towards that and that, and that this would be at, you know six billion dollars is, is not a is insignificant sum in this particular area especially when you consider it in the context of a broader um, range of measures that we have been ad advocating. Would you say then, would you say then that the absence of, a, a, well, it's more than a gesture, it's $6 billion. Mm -hmm. The absence of a move like this is what would agitate public sector workers looking at the landscape and feeling that government isn't doing enough or trying to do enough to cushion the impact mm -hmm. of external in factors on their disposable income, which, which for many, many people doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And that that is what has fueled some of the protests that we've seen in recent days. What do you well, say that's I mean, public sector workers are Jamaicans like the yes. rest of us, you know, and they are feeling the effects of the global crisis. Um, on a daily basis, they, you know, when they go to the supermarket, when they go to the market, when they go to the, they drive a vehicle, when they go to the gas station. So they are, how they are responding to what the government is proposing in terms of the reclassification mm. exercise is very much, I think, informed by what they're feeling every day in their daily lives mm. and, and the pressures that all of us are under. Mm. So the things are connected, yes. And the, the problem, of course, has been with the reclassification is that it's a complex and major um, exercise. And I think that the, the way that the government has approached it from a process point of view 
has created difficulties which could have been avoided had they been more transparent with the information. They, the unions have been complaining that they have not been receiving the information. Well, on how that. is that so? Because, you, look, as Prime Minister in waiting, I'm, I'm asking mm -hmm. you squarely, the government has said it has met with 45 of the 47 bargaining units. Mm -hmm. It has a timeline. It's dealing with central government first. Then it deals with those, with, with, with workers in the, in, the, in the public bodies. Then it is giving six months to complete all of that process of consultation and discussions. My reading of it, you may have more information, well, you should have more information, is that mm. perhaps it is that the unions themselves, opposition leader, they have not been speaking to their workers. And that doesn't replace the government speaking mm. to Jamaicans themselves because that's the government's responsibility. But I detect some of that in it. And if you've met with 45 or 47, my God, that's about 97 point something percent. I, I don't mm. see the basis for a credible claim to be made that the government hasn't been speaking with the bargaining units who represent the workers' rights and their interests. Well, the information about the, the process of consultation that they're engaged in has came out rather late. Mm. It came out after a lot of the industrial unrest had already started and occurred. And I'm thinking that when you're embarking on an exercise like this, the consultation process and the sharing of information around it and the whole communication with the stakeholders is vital. So that, I think, has been poor. Uh, for example, when it was just thrown out, I think by the finance minister, that the motor vehicle duty concession would be eliminated. Mm. That created mass consternation and anxiety amongst public sector workers because they felt that that was an important benefit. Many of them have stayed in the job because of things like that, and yes. that's an important element. And how you would value that and, and replace it in terms of taxable salary wasn't made clear, and it's still not clear. Mm. So I'm saying that although they say they're meeting with different groups and have met with different groups, the unions themselves have said that they have been requesting information. That information has been slow and forthcoming. It has come on a piecemeal basis. Mm. That is not the way to conduct an exercise like this, which is so complex and so difficult to implement. Mm. Um, so I think that if maybe, if with hindsight, mm. uh, you know, some kind of initial um, widespread communication around how this was going to be done, what the sequencing of it was, and so on, could have been better handled. And, we, and, and I think the sharing of information ought to have been a, 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 a greater level of it, priority should have been placed mm. on that. Uh, I, I think after the strikes of last week, both the Prime Minister and the, and the Minister of Finance have changed their tone. Yes. They have kind of become a little... Um, uh, more humble about it, a little bit more circumspect, a little more uh, appealing to the, 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 the others in, at the table to be patient. And, you know, I think that kind of tone should have been the tone um, from the outset, or at least should have informed how they approach it from the outset. And, I mean, I would just say to you, George, that the events themselves prove the truth of what I'm yeah, saying. But, but question mm. for you, though. Mm -hmm. You said that from the time of the budget speech, when the finance minister announced that the allowances would be rolled into the salaries and didn't give detail. Mm -hmm. This is politics, of course. You could have said something at the time that, look, this thing that this finance minister spoke about in the budget debate, please provide clarity to workers because persons are uncertain about what this really means. But perhaps it is, Mark Golding, that you and your colleagues at BNPHQ and at the opposition leader's office said, you know what, this will come back to haunt them because they've not taken the initiative to provide crucial information. And I'm agreeing with you that that narrative should have been, been pursued by the government at that time. Mm -hmm. Am I giving you too much credit by saying you saw this happening at that point when no further information was given beyond the few throwaway lines from the finance minister in the budget debate? We are not that close to the process because we are not part of the negotiations or the discussions. We heard what the Prime Minister said. Without details, so you don't want yeah. to be close to the process to be able yeah. to determine if right. they will we, pay a political price, let, let it play out, yeah. and we'll come in on the back end. Am I giving you too much credit for seeing that from, that, from March? When, I, when we heard of the plan and how it was planned to um, be implemented over three years, etc., our position was there must be certain principles that guide how you approach it. The principle of equity was very important. Transparency and full consultation and engagement with the unions. That was the, those are the principles that we articulated at the time. Mm. Now, in terms of how the government was actually going about it, in terms of who they were meeting with and when... But you would know. You have good friends in the unions. Well, 
we have some friends in the unions for sure. And, um, but truthfully, at that time, many of them were starting to express to us that they had concerns. Mm. And we, once that became manifest, we started to um, respond to that. So, for example, when the announcement about the motor vehicle concession removal came out and we were, you know, people were taken aback by that. You know, we issued releases at that time to re reaffirming the principles that we said should guide this process mm. and calling on the government to um, not just play lip service to mm. that, but to actually implement it. So, I mean, we put in a short, a short response to you, George, is this. We have not sought to play politics with this. Mm. You know, we have been critical of the process, mm. where we have seen the process as being deficient and where we see the process as undermining the success or the potential for success of this reform because we see the reform as necessary yes. you know so it's but i haven't been trying to um inflame passions around you know pay them more do more do yes. I, i've been trying to because i know that there is a process of engagement yes. going on but i have been focusing more on the deficiencies of that, of that process because i think if the if the methodology that's used of engagement and consultation and negotiation is as it should be, yes. it has the best chance of success. Hear you on that. Let's take the break and come right back. More conversation after the break. on the conversation. I'm continuing to speak with the opposition leader in Jamaica, Mark Golding, talking about crises facing the country and how the government and the people of Jamaica can get out of this rut, not caused entirely by what's happening domestically, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of global headwinds that are blowing us in the wrong direction. Mm. How would you advise public sector workers to deal with this issue of the compensation and wage increases that one would suspect are attendant to the reclassification exercise. And let me just clarify for the benefit of the viewers, a reclassification exercise does not mean a raise of pay. Mm -hmm. It's about the job, reclassification of the job. You may be working, mm -hmm. in, you may be filing, and then all of a sudden you realize that you're filing, you're or copying things, you're printing things, you're editing documents, and then your job has to be reclassified mm -hmm. because it's different from what it was at origin. That's what reclassification is. Of course, that's not for your benefit, it's for the viewers. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the original question, mm -hmm. what, 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 what sort of attitude and approach should they take going in, given that this country is at a very delicate stage where bringing our debt down is concerned and aligning our economy to start producing what it ought to have been doing over so many decades? Yeah. Well, in this case, it's not just a reclassification, but it's also a rationalization of the way in which compensation is handled in the public sector yes. to simplify uh, all of the array of benefits. 325 that, yeah, that have been salary scales, 185 allowances, yeah. That have been negotiated over many, many years and try to bring them under a simplified system with a much smaller number of um, different levels yes. and with ranges in each and try and have a rational apportionment or as, um, attribution, allocation of jobs to each of those pay levels. You know? The principle which has been articulated is one that no worker should be worse off mm. and many will be better off. And, and that's an important principle but then you know, the question really is how true is that if, um, when, it, when you're rolling in non-taxable benefits that may or may not even have been immediate cash benefits mm. into a taxable salary situation. And how that is addressed is very important because people need to feel that they can trust that that commitment which has been given will in fact be real at the end of the day. So it's, um, I think that people need to have some patience, but at the same time they need to feel that the information that is being provided is um, fulsome and that some of the thorny issues such as, let us take the motor vehicle duty concession, yes. for example. That is, a, that is a benefit that may or may not be um, utilized in a particular period of time by a worker, depending on whether they need a vehicle, whether they can afford a vehicle, mm -hmm. etc. 
but it's a it's a it's a benefit that's available to them, and and of course when you get it, it's not a a, a tax, it's not a cash benefit as such. It is a reduction of the duty that you would pay on the vehicle. Yes. So um, how you value that for everybody who was entitled to it, uh, and 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 take into account that if you bring it into salary, that value it's going to be taxed but also would be subject to pension as part of your um, pensionable salary as well, which is an, uh, a good thing on the other side. You know, all of that needs to be thought through and explained uh, in clear terms so that people can feel a little cal calmer that they're not going to be facing a much worse situation. Mm. So I think communication is absolutely vital and humility in how one communicates and uh, a certain degree of sympathy in terms of understanding the plight that people are facing and the uh, and and being and showing that there is some empathy for that and that what we're trying to do is improve life for you for us and for everybody this is a kind of uh, overall communication posture that needs to have informed it from day one. Mm. I don't think it got off on the right foot. Mm. I think everybody would accept that. Mm. And we, we have encouraged the government to uh, reboot the process and so on. I'm not um, seeking... I don't... <laughs> having been in government myself between 2012 and 2016 when Jamaica was facing a financial precipice and which, had we not taken some tough decisions and, and acted... Uh, in the best interest of the long-term survival of the country at that time, things could have easily gone awry then. I think that there are certain things that are, in terms of national development, mm. are fundamental, and which one, as a politician, has, you have a responsibility to try and think of Jamaica and think of the future of your children, your grandchildren, and everybody else's, and not the, the short-term political gains that can be derived from it. And generally speaking, that is how I approach politics. Yes. So I am not seeking to play games with this thing. There was a horrible thing last week, Friday, where persons were disseminating, from JLP sources, mm -hmm. were, were, were disseminating fake screenshots of um, fictitious conversations mm -hmm. with purporting to include me and union mm -hmm. members. I saw them, but I thought yeah. they were so ridiculous I didn't mention them, well, and I didn't they, like to mention they, them here. Uh, well, I had to mention them. Because, <laughs> you had to, of course. Yeah, because I, I think that's an example of what I would not do, mm. and the fact that they, my political opponents were trying to um, use such underhand tactics to kind of portray what the country is seeing unfolding as being somehow the responsibility of me and, and the party that I lead was very unfortunate. We need to move away from that type of politics, especially in a year like this, mm. where there is a lot at stake and, there, and things could potentially go very wrong. Mm. Everybody needs to be calm, everybody needs to be, um, pull, we need to have some cooperation and pull together. But as an opposition, how I see my role now is to try and identify where things are going wrong, what, point those out, but also try and be constructive in the suggestions we've yeah. made. So when I say, look, spend some money yeah. uh, uh, this year, um, and keeping the social fabric together. Yeah. It is because I think it's necessary uh, in the best interest of the country and our medium to long-term e economic survival and growth. Yes. I, it's not because I'm saying, well, you know, in, we should abandon the fiscal rules or we should abandon the debt reduction that we're committed to. No, it is because we are at a time when things are very, very close to the edge again. Mm. And the situation that we're in is not the, what we were we were in 2012. Mm. We have a very robust fiscal responsibility framework. We have an independent central bank with inflation targeting. Mm -hmm. The structure of the economy is different, yes. um, but we need to be mindful of the, of the risks that we're facing what, and we need to be proactive in addressing them. What message do you think is sent when one group of workers, mm -hmm. uh, reports emerged days ago that workers at the Bank of Jamaica rejected a 15% pay increase, and that was in one fiscal year. The kind of message that sends to others who are lining up to make ready their own negotiations. Mm. Well, look, I mean, we are accustomed to the, the bargaining process and mm. how it works, and typically, mm. you know, claims are made which are represent a starting point mm. which one understands is not going to be where you end up. Yes. You know, so I wouldn't put too much, attach too much significance to what a particular uh, public body mm. may have said or their workers mm. may have said. And Bank of Jamaica, in any event, is a somewhat unique case because they are separated from the rest of the public sector in, in, in some respects in mm. terms of the degree of autonomy which they mm. enjoy in how they do their thing for various reasons which we don't need to get into, yes. but, but essentially they play a unique role in the, in the whole economic arrangements of the country. 
So, you know, yes, those kind of signals are, are being set from time to time. But as I said, we need to be calm, we need to share information, we need to have dialogue, and we need to, we've done this before, you know, imagine, we have gone through structural adjustment in this country for so many years, mm. and the public sector workers have been persuaded over on many occasions to hold strain for the national good. Mm. Um, and they are committed to the progress of their nation. They, that's why they work in the public sector. But they want to be treated fairly and they want to be treated with respect. Yeah. And, if, and I think if the principle of nobody being left behind, nobody being worse off, yes. um, and if equity informs the actual allocation of the 19 um, I think it's a 19% overall increase in the wage bill that's been budgeted for for this year. Yes. So how that is allocated across the different classes of uh, different levels of workers, ensuring that there is some equity in, uh, in in how that allocation is done. I think we can we can we can we can make a success of it, mm. but it really is going to require a very um, different approach to the, than than the one that was initially pursued. In one of your press statements, you referenced. 1968 and everything crash. Oh. Uh, of course, 68 was a difficult year for us as a country, a, 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 an infant democracy at the time. I was three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't remember that much about it, but I know the, the song. Yeah, <laughs> yes. the, the song was actually recorded in 1969 by the Ethiopians yeah. Yeah, the year after. Yeah. The, 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 the point of that is this. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we were going through, of course, still teething pains from becoming independent, and a lot of our problems were homemade. Mm -hmm. I, I, see, I reference that to ask, mm -hmm. how much of what Jamaica is going through right now with managing this economy is homemade? In other words, mm -hmm. by virtue of what Clark and Wholeness are not doing right. I don't think the inflation is homemade. I think the inflation is, uh, you know, is being felt all over the world, and uh, so I can't ascribe the the inflation to the Jamaican um, government at this time. Uh, I do think that some of the the taxes that make that inflation worse could be looked at, and measures to redesign some of them to make that. For example, the hedge tax. I mean, we put the, we imposed the hedge tax, mm. uh, but we did it specifically to fund the purchase of a hedge, mm. so that if oil prices went up, we could draw down on that insurance and cushion the effect of the high oil prices on consumers. Mm. That was what it was for. Um, the government, when it changed, the JLP came into power, they didn't agree that that was a good strategy. So they didn't pursue the hedge, they didn't buy the insurance, but they kept the tax. Mm. Um, and you know, I think that's a sore point, because that tax was specifically imposed for that purpose, mm. and that purpose has not been fulfilled and they've kept the tax. Could we consider how, you know, reducing that? Or if you're going to keep it, allocating that, those resources in a way that makes it clear that they're being used to help consumers at the time. So what I would say is this. The, 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 the firestorm that we're facing is largely caused by global factors, mm. largely. But there are things that can be done to soften the blow, and there is an approach to how you communicate and deal with people. And, in, and in, especially when you're trying to roll out something like this massive reclassification of the public sector, how you consult and how the communication you have, uh, you know, that, those things require good management from an administrative point of view. And I think that that is where we're seeing some shortcomings. In, 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 this, in this moment, mm -hmm. uh, opposition leader, you are not sounding like the typical opposition leader. Because opposition leader of days, leaders of days gone by would be finding all sorts of things to throw at the government's feet. Is it mm -hmm. that the fiscal environment mm -hmm. that previous PNP administrations worked very hard to put in place and the sacrifices that were made under previous PNP administrations, that those have created an environment where this government cannot do as much wrong as mm -hmm. governments before, would you would, would would you say that? Well, I think where this government has gone wrong has been in governance, um, in particular. So, I mean, since 2016, there have been so many instances of public bodies that have been held to uh, or found to be wanting in probity. You know, there has been 
all sorts of transgressions around procurement and nepotism, cronyism, whether it be, and, you know, we go through the whole, from starting with Petrojam, Nessal, you know, right through to Caribbean Maritime University, the other aspects within the Ministry of Education, which um, where, you know, fund, there's CAP, the whole um, contracting by CAP. And, uh, so there has been a litany of poor governance there. Uh, but from the point of view of the macro fiscal management mm. of the country, we are operating within a, a, a framework mm. now, which was established largely by our government, um, in this, which was uh, with the input of our international development partners, and and also the the, the, the current government that played a role as well. And so that, you know, Jamaica's macro fiscal arrangements are a rule-based arrangement. Mm. Now, sometimes those rules may need some adjustment or deferral of implementation be mm. because the world is a dynamic place mm. and history is unfolding as we speak. And you can't just be totally um, shackled by past thinking, where, which didn't take into account the new reality. But at the same time, the overall commitment to those principles, I think, is shared on a bipartisan basis, which is a good thing. Mm. Mm. And so you, you wouldn't entertain the argument which says, well, look, the macroeconomic performance and uh, related things that has been registered under successive JLP administrations, the one before and this one continuing, is not down to any brilliance of the administration, but the structure that they are working in and the strictures which, which they are working under mm. dictate that they would be doing the job that they're doing. In other words, the PNP in office working right now would not be achieving worse results than this JLP administration. There is that view that, yeah, so, so we shouldn't mm. believe that the duo of Holness and Clark are any great shakes. I don't see any, any reason for, for ascribing greatness there, no. I, I mean, I think in terms of the, the, the basic rules that govern how we budget and, and how we, those rules have been have been largely adhered to and were designed and implemented with bipartisan support by both their, uh, the JLP and more so the PNP government between 2012 and 2016. But there are other areas where I think they have fallen short. I think that, they, and, and these are nothing to do with macro fiscal, yeah. but overall economic development. Yes where we're not seeing our human resource capital being developed properly. We're seeing situations now where HART, which is a critical training mm -hmm. engine, is not delivering. Mm -hmm. um, where the BPO, the global services industry, uh, where they are f f finding it difficult to recruit labor now because mm -hmm. they can't find people who are duly um, properly certified in skills that they need. Yeah. We have the Prime Minister talking about having to import construction workers yeah. because we don't have certified persons here. These are major flaws yes. in, the, in our economic arrangements, which must lie at the, at, at, at the foot of the current government yes. for not adequately addressing. And yes. Hart falls under the Prime Minister himself, yes. like much of the government, yes. because of this economic growth and job creation ministry. Hear you on that. Let's mm. break and come back with the final segment. I'm talking mm. with the opposition leader in Jamaica, Mark Gordon. us on the conversation. Opposition leader, Venezuela. Recently, your general secretary issued a statement on Venezuela asking Jamaica to re-engage and lamenting the fracture in the relationship with the South American nation, referencing uh, Venezuela's uh, gracious approach to the Jamaican people over time. We know of what Petro Cariba has done. And he also mentioned benefits, well, debt forgiveness to OECS nations mm -hmm. and uh, lamented the fact of the sheer take back that the Jamaican government has uh, authorized and actioned under the wholeness administration. Mm -hmm. It's funny that Jamaica finds itself in this position with Venezuela, given that the United States is looking to repair the damage to the relationship with Venezuela. Of course, different president, Trump uh, pursued a policy of maximum pressure. Biden appears to be taking a softer stance. Mm -hmm. What would you advise Prime Minister, Energy Ministry, Cabinet collectively to do to make repair that strong relationship with Venezuela at this time? Our approach to international relations is that it must be guided at all times by principle. 
And one of the principles that we um, ascribe to is non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries, mutual respect, and solidarity, especially with developing nations and in our region. Venezuela has been tremendously helpful to Jamaica. The Petrocarib um, financing facility for oil purchases was perhaps the most significant and concessionary financing ever made available to Jamaica. And it was all topped off when we did the debt exchange with them, where we bought back uh, the, the, the Petrocarib debt at, I think, less than 50 cents in the dollar. And that you know, was effectively a savings to the Jamaican people of one and a half billion US dollars. And, and that transaction alone reduced our debt to GDP ratio by close to 10%. That was really at the generosity of, of, the, of the Venezuelan people at the time. They've, as you've said, recently they've done a, a major debt reduction for the OECS countries mm -hmm. in, um, in the, the small islands in, in the Eastern Caribbean. And, and they are on, as I heard, I think I heard they're offering oil at, at a 35% discount in price mm. um, to those nations. So they're, they're having, <laughs> maintaining good relations with persons who have been good to you is important. Uh, we feel that this government has not done that. Um, they, first of all, they, the expropriation by law, um, non-consensually taking the shares that the Venezuela had, uh, acquired by investing in Petrojam uh, at a price which was not negotiated with Venezuela and putting the money into escrow, that was not an act, I think, of, uh, that one would say is, is anything other than a hostile act towards the, the Venezuelan government of the day. And basically kowtowing to President Trump and his attempts to marginalize and, and isolate Venezuela and through recognizing Guaido um, as, a, as, a, as a head of, of state there. These are things which I think have, have put Jamaica, cast Jamaica in a bad light in terms of how we would be perceived as a nation that stands by issues of principle. Um, you know, the Venez I think in today's paper there's a report that the Venezuelan representative here is saying, you know, we're still friends with Jamaica and, mm. you know, we're prepared to, to treat with and that's And that's good. And I would expect that from mm. them. Mm. I think that the opportunity should be taken in the upcoming Summit of the Americas for Jamaica to show some solidarity with the rest of the Caribbean who want to see um, Venezuela present and, and, and Cuba present. And uh, if, if that doesn't happen, I'm not saying we shouldn't go, but I don't think we should entertain um, the idea of Guaido being the head of state. He's basically been discredited. Uh, and his position, which he held at the time when the U.S. was trying to, and certain other countries in support of the U.S. were seeking to recognize him as the head of state, he no longer holds that position. Mm. And it's quite clear that the de facto um, uh, government uh, of Venezuela and head of state of Venezuela is Nicolas mm. Maduro. So, you know, I think that we, the government should, I think, try to restore some balance there and yes. try and, and I think there's a lot that Jamaica uh, has lost as a result of how we've approached that matter. And, you know, I'm not saying we should be transactional because I don't think that we should approach foreign affairs and international relations on a, a transactional basis. Mm. But on just uh, the principle of solidarity that Jamaica has long adhered to, we should get back on track with that. Are you in full support and the opposition by extension, or mm. even you alone as the mm. opposition leader speaking for yourself, are you in full support of Jamaica's candidate for the role of Car uh, Commonwealth Secretary General? If Jamaica has a candidate... Jamaica does have a candidate. In any, any forum, any forum, international forum, where Jamaica's putting forward a candidate, I think we as Jamaicans should support that candidate. Mm. Uh, I do think that it, the way in which that has been handled is very unfortunate. Mm. Uh, you know, I think it has created issues again within CARICOM. Um, we, we have a situation now where we have two CARICOM candidates who are vying for the same position. That's less than ideal. Um, it, it undermines our, the chances of our own candidate. You know, so from that point of view, I think it's been very you know, poorly handled. But having said that, you know, I, in terms of Jamaica putting forward a candidate, I think we have to support that candidate. Yeah. Mm. The PNP and traction, Mark Golding. Mm. The industrial disputes, the PNP, of course, has played the role that you expect uh, an opposition with its finger on the pulse to mm -hmm. play. Mm -hmm. It has, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, you marched on Monday, Hero Circle, yeah. yes, yeah. to deliver that that mm -hmm. that, that, that that ministerial uh, guidance to mm -hmm. the finance minister. Do you feel as if the people are feeling the PNP? Do Jamaicans have an appetite for the kind of leadership 
that you are purporting or that you purport to give if you were prime minister, or is this still a whole this country? Well, we are coming from a, a major loss in the 2020 general elections. We only have 14 MPs out of the 63. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do. I'm a relatively, um, I'm a relative newcomer mm -hmm. on, the, on the national scene at the level of, of a leader, a political yes. leader. So I have a lot of work to do to get people to know who I am, how I think, what I can offer. Uh, all I can tell you is I've been going on the road quite a lot. I'm all over the country. And uh, the response has been very, very positive. Mm. And people are willing to engage. They're glad to see me. And they want to see us back. They mm. want to see the party strong. And you know, part of my job is to try and um, make the party uh, uh, in, in election ready and government ready mm. and we're doing a number of things in that area and mm. I think we're improving every single day so you know th we are coming from a, a difficult place mm. but I believe that we are getting stronger and, uh, and that we will be increasingly seen as a viable alternative and that people are going to be looking to the People's National Party again to take Jamaica forward in a way that can build a more inclusive society, a fairer society, um, and, a, and, a, and more integrity in public life. I mean, you know, talk, you talked about the wholeness Clark duo. I mean, the five in four, mm. you know, they inherited a situation where all of the macroeconomic indicators were in the positive direction mm. when they won in 2016 by one seat. They have not delivered five and four. Mm. They have not delivered growth. Even before the pandemic, in the, in the pandemic hit, in the last year before the pandemic mm. hit, growth, growth was essentially 0% mm. in 2019, that calendar year. So they have really failed. The Economic Growth Ministry has been a failure. Mm. They have not delivered le high levels of economic growth. And part of the problem is their whole philosophy and the structure of their government and the way they prioritize what's available does not put the people at the center of what we're doing. You see it in law enforcement, the use of states of emergency as a policing tool, mm. probably unconstitutional. That's the advice we have received, mm. legal advice mm. we've received. And we have said to them, look, we're not prepared to support a, a, a measure which is unconstitutional because that is not in the best interest of the people or the society. Mm. There are other things that can be done and should be done to bring mm. the thing under control. We've supported them in the, in the development of the ZOSOs. We, modified some aspects of the way in which the law was designed to make it um, a better law. Mm -hmm. And we, every single time that has come to Parliament, we have given it support because we know that there are communities in Jamaica where the residents need mm -hmm. that kind of saturation and need to see soldiers and police working together to, to make them safe. And we, as, as leaders in the society, we must support those mm -hmm. people. But what we will not do is um, support things that are are uh, in, our, in our best judgment, yeah. not in the best But, but, but against what you say, mm -hmm. Holness and Clark are still seen by the majority of Jamaicans, you believe, as mm -hmm. trustworthy. People be, believe mm -hmm. that they have a brilliant finance minister, mm -hmm. Mark Holling. They believe that if they look at the, if, they, if, you, if, you, if you reference what happened in the budget debate, they think that he was a star of the whole debate, the way he rebutted uh, suggestions made by yourself, criticisms made by yourself, your spokesman on finance, uh, Julian Robinson, they believe that notwithstanding the problems, they would rather have these two men with their hand on the wheel rather than the PNP at this time. So in that, you have a problem. I don't know who this day is that you're speaking of, Judge. But no, I, if, if you draw a line across yeah. polls that have, uh, have, have, have been done, yeah. polls that have been done, mm. the response from the people who interact with the media. I'm talking letter writers to the editors, people who call. I know that both sides call. I've been a journalist for mm. 17 years. I know that. Uh, I'm not even going to say social media because we know how that can be manipulated. But the feeling in the country mm. is that we have a finance minister who knows his thing inside out. They have a prime minister that they can trust. And they are looking and measuring that against a PNP that they believe still needs to be whipped into shape, which is pretty much what you said. Just know that there is work for you to do as a leader individually and work for your party to do as a collective. Yeah. Well, in terms of having a leader who we can trust, I mean, if you're talking about polls, Mr. Holness's poll results have been falling significantly from where they were two years ago. So he has some issues that he has to address there. I mean, I, and I have some issues as well because the polls show that I'm not well known and I'm trying to address those. Mm -hmm. 
But I don't think that the, the wider public has the kind of confidence and certainly trust mm. that you're suggesting they, they have in the current leadership of the country. Given all the scandals that they've seen, mm. why would they have that trust? Mm. Uh, we have a major issue with um, integrity and governance in the country, which I think is, is continuing to plague them. And it is for us as an opposition to show that we have the ideas, proposals and programs that can address the issues of the day. Yes, um, Nigel Clark, uh, you know, as I said, he's inherited a framework and he's been executing in that framework. And I give him credit for some of the things he's done. I like the work that has been done on um, providing provisions for ad addressing national, natural disasters, mm -hmm. for example, and mm -hmm. trying to put reserves in place for that. And he's been working well with the multilaterals around doing that. And I've said so publicly before. But, you know, I'm not just <laughs> trying to tear down for the sake of tearing down. Yes. But I think that the, the way, the glowing terms uh, in which you the, have the, assessed Those are not them, my words. Those are reflected words, oh, Mark. I, I don't know about there that. You go. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't know what, I don't know what reflect, what's oh. reflecting. Maybe you're seeing yourself in the mirror, George. No, I don't no, know. That's no, a reflection no, no, we're talking no, no, about. No, no, no. Now, certainly from where I stand, mm. I'm, not hear, I'm not hearing that kind of glowing report. Yes. Yeah. That's not, that's and not also, amazing. having the last word in the, in the budget debate yes. is of tremendous value. It is. It you is. can remember even all this show, how we used to, you know... He, sa he saved his fireworks for the end. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's politics. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I competed at three world championship debates. I know the importance of having the last word. Yeah, you, you, you have the advantage. Finally, mm -hmm. your work program. You say you are on a mission because mm -hmm. it, it, it's refreshing that you admit that there is work to do. Mm -hmm. Previous people would have made it, made it seem as if, you know, it's all good and jolly. Mm -hmm. you, you have, you've, you've embarked on a national get-to-know-me program, I'm calling it that. The sure. PNP has had a bus tour mm -hmm. interrupted by COVID. Yes. Uh, what about overseas? the diasporans mm -hmm. who want to meet Mark Golding, press flesh, talk to you about ideas face to face. Thank you for that opportunity, John. Yes, yeah, so, you know, we have been engaging with the diaspora mainly through things like Zoom calls and what, um, but we are going to be taking the opportunity to visit um, North America mm -hmm. in July. We're doing a tour of the Eastern Seaboard in mid-July. Uh, we'll be uh, visiting, I think it's four cities mm -hmm. and meeting with um, Jamaicans and some U.S. officials as well while we're there. We're very much looking forward to that. And, you know, we're, our message is going to be one of positive and, um, positivity and hope. We believe that the PNP can uh, tackle the fundamental problems in the country. Uh, we are, uh, our policies and programs are people-centered, early childhood development. We see the, the weaknesses in the education mm -hmm. system, the need to tackle those frontally. Uh, training is another area. We've already discussed the deficiencies there. Yes. Human resource development as a, as a core um, priority for, for, the, for our government, to, which will have a positive impact on crime and violence, which will have a positive impact on growth and inclusive growth, which will have a positive impact on our global competitiveness as, a, as an economy. These are the things that we think we can deliver. And this is what I, part of the message, what we talk about, the Jamaican dream, that, and people being able to, to achieve their goals and their aspirations through ensuring that the system is designed to help them rather than hold them back. This is what I want the next PNP government to deliver. For Looking people. back on your journey so far as opposition mm -hmm. leader, would you say that you are leading at this time, a potential winning team that can give Jamaica the right kind of governance. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think that we have uh, a good mix of experience of, of persons who have thought, who can think creatively, who have delivered solutions in the past. And we have some very bright and able young people as well in our midst. So I think there, there's no doubt that the team is solid. Uh, and we just need, um, need to continue to develop our ideas. We have a process underway now, which will, by the July, should have reached fruition, which will help to provide a restatement of our philosophical framework uh, that, uh, and how we see things generally, which will be um, the, provide the framework uh, that we will test our, our actual specific policies and programs against. I'm looking forward to that as well. And then in terms of communication and, 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 and being out there, that is something that we're working on on a daily basis as well. I see tremendous progress being made, and I look forward to, to continuing that. Opposition parties are usually riven by division. You've had your own issues with members who've been disaffected because they want, well, their tilt at leadership was unsuccessful. Can you report today that the, the party has settled down under your hand? I think it's, it is settling down. I think it, there's still some work to be done. But I think it's in a much better place than it was. And that is a work in progress that we're um, constantly uh, seeking to rebuild that kind of cohesiveness that we need to have. And I think as people see 
that the, the country needs us and that they, the country wants to see a strong People's National Party. All of my colleagues, I think, believe in that. And so that, that provides a tremendous basis on which we can uh, realign ourselves around a common vision and move forward together. Here you on that. Opposition leader, thank you very much for stopping by. Respect. Good. Thank good. you, George. Then there you go. That's it for the conversation this week. Much more next week. <laughs>